Hi students, Lisa Schimmold, Crafton Hills College, part two, take number, oh, I don't know, 27, of uh, physical methods of control. Let's go ahead and pick it up with pasteurization. Developed by Louis Pasteur in the late 1800s, Louis was uh, approached by French wine merchants who wanted to know why sometimes their wine was spoiling and they were producing vinegar rather than wine. Uh, so Pasteur did some research and he determined there were two types of microorganisms in the wine. There were yeast in there and they were the organisms that were converting the sugar in the grape juice into alcohol and that's what was wanted. Uh, and then there were sometimes bacteria in there that would convert the sugar into acetic acid, which is vinegar. Those were the undesirables. So through some experimenting, Pasteur determined that if the wine was mildly heated, it would kill the bacteria and the yeast would survive and that would prevent the wine from spoiling. This was good news and eventually the technique was applied to milk. Uh, this was done to help prevent the transmission of tuberculosis. There is a species of mycobacterium named Mycobacterium bovis that infects cows and humans can become infected if they drink contaminated unpasteurized milk. Uh, so let's talk a little specifically about uh, pasteurization of milk. Two techniques, classic and modern. Classic involves heating the milk to 63 degrees Celsius and maintaining that temperature for 30 minutes. Modern pasteurization takes the milk up another nine degrees, up to 72 degrees Celsius, and the duration of the heating uh, is reduced to 15 seconds. They achieve the same results. I understand modern pasteurization does produce a better tasting product, um, and I do want to point out that when we pasteurize something, and there are other things you can pasteurize as well, such as uh, fruit juices, but when we pasteurize something, we are not sterilizing it. We're just hopefully killing any potential pathogens and reducing the levels of microorganisms in there to safe levels and uh, allowing the beneficial bacteria such as lactobacillus to survive. So your milk is uh, definitely not sterilized. Now we can sterilize milk and other products. There's a technique called ultra high temperature processing or UHT processing. You can um, sterilize milk or fruit juices or I'm sure other things that I'm just not thinking of right now by taking the temperature up to 140 degrees Celsius and the duration of the exposure is going to be somewhere between two to four seconds depending on what it is we're trying to sterilize. So you do wind up with a sterile product that is shelf stable. That means you can store it at room temperature, no refrigeration required. Uh, typically it will be stable for uh, maybe six to nine months and um, they sterilize things like the little plastic creamer cups that you see in the restaurant for your coffee and um, some milk products like um, that chocolate milk, I think they call it Yoohoo, I think it's uh, UHT processed. Um, and um, But once the product's been opened, if there's any leftover, you need to treat it like you would fresh milk and refrigerate any uh, remaining product. Okay, now let's go ahead and talk about filtration. There are um, many products that are not heat stable, such as uh, vaccines and liquid vitamin solutions, um, antibiotic solutions, those are just some examples. Uh, they are not heat stable and they would be destroyed by any of the techniques that we've talked about already. So what we do instead is remove the microbes from those products and we do so by filtration. So here's how this works, and you've got a diagram in your notes, um, of actually a photograph of a, of a filtration unit. So what we do is we pour the liquid into the top chamber and uh, put the lid on it, and then we attach a vacuum line to the, um, there's kind of like a plastic nipple um, right next to the filter. Turn the vacuum on, the vacuum pulls the liquid through the filter, the filter has pores that are small enough to retain the contaminants, and then when the liquid um, uh, enters the container on the bottom, it is uh, sterilized. Now, uh, there are filters that have different uh, pore sizes, depending on what it is we're trying to remove, and these filters may be made of uh, cellulose, which is a, um, a plant-based material, uh, or perhaps a, a plastic polymer fiber. And um, two of the ranges that are often used in pore sizes would be filters that have pores that range between 0.22 and 0.45 microns in diameter. And that would filter out 
a lot of stuff, most bacteria, for example. Now, if we need to filter out viruses and virus-like entities, then we would use a filter with smaller pores, uh, one that has pores that are approximately 0.01 microns in diameter. All right, uh, we have another technique that uses filtration, and that's called high efficiency particulate air filters, or they're called HEPA filters. And they've become pretty mainstream over the last decade or so. Now, a HEPA filter will filter out anything that's larger than 0.3 microns in diameter, and that's a whole lot of stuff. That would be most bacteria, uh, dust, pollen, mold, animal dander. Uh, they are used, HEPA filters are used in the hospitals, in operating rooms, and also in the rooms of burn patients. Uh, they may be on your uh, central heat and air conditioning system. You may have a HEPA filter on your vacuum cleaner. And if somebody in your family suffers from allergies, you can even buy a standalone unit to put in their bedroom and that can really increase their quality of life. Uh, so HEPA filters, very useful and much less expensive than they used to be. All right, let's turn our attention now to the use of low temperature to control the growth of microorganisms. And right now I'm talking about household applications, household refrigerators, household freezers. Now your refrigerator is just slowing down the metabolism of many microorganisms that spoil our food. And all that's doing is buying us time so that we can consume the food without becoming ill. It's not really preventing the food from spoiling. Household freezers, they most certainly won't kill all microorganisms, but they are helpful. Let me explain. When we freeze food in our household freezer, like let's say we buy a pound of hamburger, we put it in the freezer, it's going to take a few hours for that uh, hamburger to be completely frozen. So that's a relatively slow means of freezing. I mean, as opposed to plunging the hamburger into liquid nitrogen at minus 70 degrees Celsius, which would be an instantaneous freeze. So slow freezing, like at home. When we freeze cells slowly, it allows ice crystals to form uh, in the water that's contained in their cytoplasm. And those ice crystals can actually pierce the plasma membrane, the cell wall, and kill the cell. So that would have a lethal effect on cells. Not effective on everything, but certainly helpful. All right, now let's talk about osmotic pressure as a means to control microbial growth. I've talked about this a little bit before. What, I'm, what I mean is placing, or I should say creating a hypertonic environment. So uh, adding a high concentration of salts, or sugars to the environment to inhibit the growth of most bacteria. There are still fungi that may be able to survive in those conditions, uh, but um, this creates a situation where most bacteria can't grow. Good way for preserving foods, uh, such as um, fruits and uh, meats can be salted and dried meat, fish. Uh, and this was a technique that was used to preserve food back before household refrigeration was available. So people would make jams and jellies to preserve uh, fruits for winter time when those fresh fruits uh, weren't available. Now, let's talk about what could possibly contaminate those foods. Well, fungi, molds, for example, you may find if you've had a jar of jelly in your refrigerator for months and months, you may open it up to find some fuzzy mold growth on its surface. And then the bacteria that we refer to as the extreme halophiles, or even just some of the regular halophiles, salt lovers, they may be able to grow on salted meat or fish. But this is a pretty darn good method for preserving food. Okay, now uh, we can also use radiation to control the growth of microorganisms. And we have two, two types, two categories of radiation, ionizing and non-ionizing radiation. When we talk about or describe radiation, usually we're going to describe it in terms of its wavelength. And a shorter wavelength equals a higher energy content. Higher energy content means that the radiation is going to be more effective at penetrating multiple barriers and getting to where it needs to to uh, damage the DNA of the microorganism and, and kill it. Uh, Ionizing radiation includes things like um, x-rays and gamma rays and 
high energy electron beams. Those are just um, ionizing radiations at different wavelengths. And they can be used to um, preserve foods, to actually sterilize a number of foods. Now, this is a, a practice that is used in many parts of the world, Europe and Asia, for example, not as commonly used in the United States because Americans just don't really like the concept of using radiation to sterilize their food, but um, what happens is, is when ionizing radiation strikes cells, now whether those cells are ours or bacteria, they, um, those rays or those um, uh, types of radiation literally will cleave DNA molecules and this will have a lethal effect on the microorganisms. Now here's, um, here's an application for ionizing radiation. Uh, let's say we have um, slaughtered a cow and um, processed the meat into steaks. Those steaks could be vacuum sealed and then irradiated and we would have a, a literally a sterilized product inside that vacuum packed um, uh, bag. Well, this is good because we can reduce the incidence of food poisoning uh, by ingesting those types of foods. Um, I understand, I've not, in, I've not um, actually eaten any irradiated meat before, uh, but I understand the color is slightly different and the taste is slightly different and slightly less nutritional um, content, but not, not hugely significant. But in my way of thinking, I would say if we just practice um, safe techniques in the slaughterhouse, we can uh, um, minimize the need to do these types of things to our foods. Uh, many times when food um, like meat is contaminated, it's contaminated from the gut of the animal that was slaughtered. And that's because the uh, the meat was not properly processed. So let's just uh, practice safe uh, techniques in our slaughterhouses if we're going to continue to eat meat. Uh, milk can also be sterilized and this is a, a good method for being able to deliver a, a very nutritious food to people, uh, let's say in remote areas that maybe don't have uh, refrigeration available to them. Uh, we can um, irradiate grain in silos. Uh, silos may contain um, hundreds of thousands of pounds of grain. And one of the problems is, is that insects will get in there. And so sometimes those grains are irradiated to kill those insect pests. Uh, there are some medical products that can be sterilized in this way as well. Now, non-ionizing radiation, that's UV light. And not nearly the energy content that we find in ionizing radiation. So that means UV light doesn't do a very good job of penetrating barriers. For example, uh, if there's even a drop of water between the UV light and the microorganism that we're trying to kill, uh, it, the, more, the microorganism will be shielded by that water. When UV light does actually strike cells, it causes um, um, loops to form in their DNA, and so there's going to be a loss of genetic information when the cell tries to uh, divide, and that will be uh, lethal. Uh, UV light has become kind of um, popular in our society, but it's not all that effective. Uh, the most effective wavelength of UV light, though, is 260 nanometers. Sometimes they use it in hospitals, in um, operating rooms, and um, I don't know, I can't think of any other applications off the top of my head right now, but uh, I've seen uh, UV light um, devices to sterilize your toothbrush. I wouldn't get too terribly excited about that, and I would suggest that just replace your toothbrush uh, more often than go to those kinds of uh, extremes. And then finally, uh, in this section of physical methods of control is a process called either freeze drying or lyophilization. Uh, they also refer to it as um, cryodesiccation. Let's talk about that. Uh, this is a method that involves flash freezing, I mean like in liquid nitrogen, taking the temperature down to somewhere between minus 54 degrees Celsius to maybe as low as minus 72 degrees Celsius, and this is going to happen pretty much instantly. Uh, we can preserve certain foods this way, um, preserve foods, um, prepare them in a manner that makes them easier to transport. But another use for lyophilization is to preserve microorganisms such as bacteria for research, 
um, or um, educational purposes. And what you do in this case is you grow the organism in a liquid medium and then you uh, put it in the lyophilization machine which is going to freeze them instantly and then vacuum will be applied and that will cause the water in the cells to um, evaporate away. So it literally, the water will be converted from a solid state to a gas state immediately and we'll wind up with a small dry pellet on the bottom of the container. When we're uh, using this technique to preserve microorganisms, what we would do when we're ready to reanimate them is add some uh, sterile liquid media like triptych soy broth, place them in the incubator for a day or two, and they will literally reanimate and then we can use them in the laboratory or for research. All right, you guys, that does it for physical methods of control. I hope to see you soon and um, have a nice day. Thank you.